Okay, the video is now up and running. The first thing I want to do, and I hope you've enjoyed the career fair, I kind of cruised by and talked to a couple of companies. They're all mostly EEs and a couple of CS, so you guys should take some pride in the fact that you've chosen a degree field that seems to be turning, has have turned around pretty good. I mean, there's more internships. There's another company that didn't show up because they didn't, couldn't get a booth space. They want two interns. I've got the card. It's a company that does circuit board something or another. Um, I can't remember the name of the company though, but um, they're, they're looking for the names. That's what they want. They want the names of all of you that are going to our juniors and seniors, and they haven't been able to get those names yet. So, I assume that most of you have your resume in a resume book or something to be available. Jared, what's his last name? He was in senior design last semester. He works for them right now as an intern. He's graduating this semester. He's the guy, if you know who I'm talking about. Okay, I'll have more info on it. Before, since we're getting started, here's something that I thought maybe you'd, you'd want to know is happening if you have an interest in this. We have the LabVIEW campus tour bus, which will be down in front of the library tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Oh, the 15th. Okay, I do have it off by week. I was thinking it was tomorrow. Well, it is going to be kind of busy that Friday, but you'll have a chance in the afternoon. This is a topic I'm interested in, the USRP, which is the Universal Software Radio Peripheral, since we have a couple of those. I've basically been through all of the exposure, but I haven't been through exposure recently. It's something I think you should go take a look at if you have the time. They're, they're out re recruiting um, to get you exposed to their products mostly. They may be looking to hire interns too. They, I know they hire a lot of interns. They're in Austin, Texas. That's where their headquarters are. I think it just slipped through the crack. I don't know. I really don't know. I was there this morning. I was on a teleconference a, a little while ago and RT Logic was not present either. There were some new companies, though, that haven't been present before. Like Samtech, which makes little miniature connectors. They just bought a company in Colorado Springs, and now they're looking for two interns. Okay, what I want to go back and visit again is more on single sideband. We had looked at this envelope analysis last time. We had looked at the whole of single sideband last time, and I guess I should back up and say the fundamentals of single sideband all came down to these two equations right here. The upper single sideband and the lower single sideband involving a signal that's a Hilbert transform of the message. And then the phase shift modulator implementation is this block diagram right here. And the Weaver modulator is the one that's in the project. And then there's other applications and variations of single sideband. Demodulation, we looked at the coherent demodulator. There's not anything too elaborate to say about it except that it works. It works perfectly, but a coherent demodulator is generally always going to work really, really well because you have a coherent reference. And if, as long as you have that available, you pretty much have it made. But we already have been learning that it's not readily available. It's like if you're sitting there in the, in the lab and suppose you put the transmitter on one lab station and the receiver on another lab station. If you wanted to do coherent demodulation, you could just string an extra cable from that bench to, to the receiver bench and then you'd have it. But in the real world, do you have that magic cable available? You don't. So then that comes down to the getting the reference back and coherently locking up and tracking to it, which at a meeting I was at this morning at Emergent for a little task I'm going to work on as part of a project that was started over a year ago. I'm going to be doing some coherent receiver analysis, 
because it's always it's just always comes up in satellite communications. People want to do coherent demodulators because they like the performance they get and they're willing to spend the price to get the recovery carrier recovery system, usually with a phase lock loop of some sort, which we'll be getting into phase lock loops after we get into angle modulation. But you'll you'll be exposed to phase lock loops at that time. The more exciting thing in terms of the analysis and can it work is the envelope detector based means. So we looked at this simple envelope detector where we used this technique called carrier reinsertion and I talked about the envelope analysis if you remember where you get the resultant formed and it boiled down to this equation right here was the output of the envelope detector. So it's, it's the baseband waveform that comes out, which is that envelope from last time. Remember the carrier is now stripped away. You've got just what's fluctuating slowly is the envelope. And then essentially in all communications receivers where you're getting a message back, it always, it's, and this is no exception, inherent inside of here at the tail end of this there's effectively a low pass filter in there because remember what what the circuit model for the envelope detector is it consists of the M half wave rectifier and then there's an R and a C to form a low pass filter so there's something that that removes the high frequency in this case it's to recover the envelope so this was the model of the envelope detector output and this was the exact model under the approximation of the binomial expansion which I talked about briefly last time this math approximation right here you can say that for x much less than 1 which wasn't quite the final form I put this in but I, I said if you, if you were to divide through by k you'd be making that second term there be the small term and then the dominant term is, is the other term which you could factor out front if you wanted to too so that you get back the message plus a large bias and that's just an approximation but to make it a little bit well that's the approximation and then I went on after that and I said how about non-coherent carrier reinsertion so the, the carrier you reinsert has got a frequency error in it is what I was modeling here and I did it just for a single tone message so the message was a single tone carried that through the same analysis and then the envelope that you end up with is is again of this form this is the exact envelope it's a little bit more complicated when you expand it out and pull out um, when you expand that out using the large K approximation then you get back this last line down here which says you get back the message with a small frequency error added onto it but it's only an upshift or a downshift it's not both plus a bias term so let's do some demo on that or at least I've got a demo put up in Mathematica I don't know if I've ever done any Mathematica animations yet this semester in this class but Mathematica gives you the capability to put some math models together and then you can put sliders and things to vary parameters and kind of put things into motion. So I took the first envelope detection model with a coherent carrier reinsertion and I took that model that we just had except now I've got a sinusoid rather than M of T. So this is the message right here and then that's the amplitude of the reinserted carrier and this sign over here, remember, would be what? When we talk about single sideband. If that is the message, if cosine is the message, what sign? It's the Hilbert, it's the Hilbert transform of that cosine. So in the real system, this would be m of t over here, and this would be m hat of t sitting in here. And here I have a slider on here so I can change the amount of carrier reinsertion and if I take the carrier reinsertion level down to zero I get nothing at the output 
but as, as I bring it up, it kind of goes through a point where it's, it's looking like it's getting the message back, but it's getting, it's very distorted. Notice if I, as I increase K, it gets more peaked. But then finally, as I bring it up higher, it's biasing up, so now it looks like the message. And of course, the math model we were looking at basically said K is much greater than, than 1 in this case, since that's the amplitude of the message and then it's recovering the message quite well with, with a DC bias on there. If I keep bringing K up, I'm not altering anything. If it's too small, though, it's just, that would be highly distorted. You, that would not be pleasant to listen to. Sound reasonable? I mean, the only way to do this is exactly to write out the math for it. You can't approximate the in-between cases. This binomial expansion idea lets you go to one extreme or the other, but you can't get this, this sort of in-between condition. is hard to, to get without doing the full math model. The second one I did just puts the reinserted carrier at a delta of omega away from the message. So this one, I have the same effect of bringing up the bias term, but now if the c local carrier is, d is delta omega mega away from the received carrier, it just imparts a small amount of frequency shift in the recovered message. And this is for a single tone message. So the next stage in my demo is going to be to go run the um, simulation that you're working on for the project and then let you listen to that so you can hear what, what it sounds like on speech. And you'll, you don't have to do that for the project, but I'll, I'll show you how you can do it if you want to. Any questions on this part, though? This is the still math modeling. The, the MATLAB simulation is math modeling, but it's more true to form. It's discrete time or DSP-based. So these are some of the signals from the simulation, but I guess what I need to do probably is go back and take a look at what's going on in the simulation. So I don't think I put that up on my list here. So getting back to what we looked at last week, the simulation consists of designing a modulator function that gets replicated or gets utilized three times. So what, what I've given you in the project code is I've given you a top-level function, what I call a top-level function. And I guess if you're a Verilog person, you know what top levels are. So I have this top-level simulation function, and then it calls a lower level function, the, this um, modulator, three different times to generate these three signals, adds them up, sends them over a channel. In this case, the channel is ideal. It doesn't put any noise in, but it does have a band limiting effect, which I modeled with a bandpass filter at the tail end. And then I send that signal into a coherent demodulator. And that's the other function that you have to write. So you have to write a modulator and a demodulator function, and then you have to t do some testing and some experiments with what you've written. So I'm going to run the top level. I'm not going to go inside the individual functions because that would spoil the fun of that, but I, I'll talk about them, and I'm going to give you some hints, particularly on the demodulator. So we're, it's designed for a message signal that's been sampled at eight kilosamples, and according to Nyquist, low-pass sampling theorem, it says that we would have to sample at greater than twice the highest frequency. So in this case, we're sample the speech signal sam vectors that I've given you are sample at 8K, so the message bandwidth is 4 kilohertz. So each one of these signals, the blue signals in here, occupies 4 kilohertz when it's um, single sideband modulated, because it, I'm just taking one of the two sidebands. But remember, like I said um, last week when we were looking at this, in order to have some space to move around and, and transmit this signal, 
I've got the sampling rate at 96 kilohertz so the folding frequency is 48 kilohertz so we upsample the signals internally to the in the simulation and have things working at 48 kilohertz or I mean 96 kilosamples per second and now you can relocate the signal on a carrier frequency that I've got nominally set between 16 and 32 because I'm saying that's the allocated transmission bandwidth and there's a filter in the top level function that that defines that making sense so far it's upsampling is just a necessity in order to get the simulation some bandwidth region to take signals from baseband and then move them up to to act like a real carrier but a real carrier would not be between 16 and 32 kilohertz because that would be really um, ultra low frequencies to transmit that it's just in order to keep the simulation manageable we're putting it at a at a carrier frequency that's an emulation of what a real carrier frequency would be like question so the sound files are going to be in eight are going to be sampled I mean, are going to come in eight kilo samples per second yes for upsampling do you specify how we're supposed to upsample like we could just like yeah blanks, like we could, we could just repeat this the signal like whatever eight times well, to upsample it requires what's called interpolation. So there's two blocks, and I have a little block that talks about that. I'm, I'm going to move on and kind of review through that, but th then you're using MATLAB signal processing toolbox functions to do this. You're just plugging into them as building blocks. So it's, there's two elements, but I'll explain that. So ready to move on? The bottom line, though, is when you get done with this, these three are going to be variables. You can move those around. You can spread them out a little bit more. You can make them closer together. So I have you do different things with the locations of those. Obviously, you don't want to put FC1 on top of FC2. So if, the, if you need 4 kilohertz to keep the, the signal spaced, what's the minimum spacing? FC1 and FC2 need to be at, at very minimum how far apart, 4K. But because filtering is not perfect, a little bit of guard space, they call it a guard frequency band, would be implemented. So you, you'll be able to see that. And the design of your filters internally will control how band limited it is. So this is the top level, but we'll look at that in the MATLAB code here in a second. So the modulator design is this thing from the homework assignment, and then implemented in DSP. And this is a little review down here of how we'd use digital filters to act like analog filters, let's say. And difference equations replace, say, an active filter in analog design. It's one of the things I think I mentioned before. Analog filters, if, if I had an H of S like this, if I wanted to describe that in the time domain, it's a differential equation, right? Do you implement a differential equation just by throwing it on, on the page and have it work? No. You have to have a circuit realization to make transform a differential equation into some circuit realization and you've got lots of different ways of doing that however in digital signal processing when you have a system function like this h of z it becomes the difference equation and this was first seen in 2610 and when i wrote this 2610 was still rather new in the curriculum so actually the very first semester i used this in 2007 there were still a few remnants from the old curriculum that hadn't had digital signal processing at all. But that's not true anymore. So the difference equation is a direct means of implementing it. So I don't know if that's ever impacted you since you left 2610 and you've been through electronics or are still taking electronics that DSP, the algorithm, is the implementation. It comes right from the difference equation math, whereas in circuits, a differential equation is like, what? What do I do with this? So you, that's why EEs have to learn about circuit design and circuit theory and everything, because that's how you un come to understand how you realize things. I don't know if that is, is that, do you feel that impact, or is that just ho-hum? I never really thought about that. 
I've had quite a few years to think about it, so I guess to me it's, it's a really big deal. It's got pros and cons to it, but DSP seems to be the way most everything is done these days. Not everything, but a lot of things are. You still have mixed signal designs, though, of digital, DSP, and analog. So this is the implementation of that Weaver circuit in DSP, and it also has embedded inside of it the upsampling operation. So Rob's question was pertaining to you know, this area in particular, where you have two signal flows that you have to get upsampled on from 8K to 96K. So nominally, the interpolate block is going to take care of what's called the upsampling and the interpolation filter all in one block. So it actually contains the upsampler and this LPF together. And MATLAB has a function that does this. I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. You also need to, to, to design some filters, like the low-pass filters there before the interpolator that, that cut off at half the bandwidth. So let's make make it clear what that W is. What is W? 4K. So this implementation in this modulator, believe it or not, has a bandwidth that slices at W over 2. And you're going to have to think about that if you want to unravel the mystery of this, but that's basically cutting off at 2 kilohertz. But the signal has been shifted up in frequency by a cosine and, a, and by a sine that's at what frequency? It happens to be at W over 2 also. Now, just to make things clear, why do I have N over FS1 sitting in there? What is that representing in term, from a sampling. continuous time? That's the sampling. So what I've done is I've had to take T, and T is going to go to N times delta T, let's say. If I want to look at it as delta T or... <coughs> When I teach DSP, I just call it capital T, and that's the sample spacing. T is 1 over the sampling rate. And I'm calling FS1 the native rate that we start with. So FS1 is this guy down here. It's the 8 kilohertz. So if I'm working in an 8 kilohertz sample signal and I want to work with sines and cosines that were originally continuous time, I have to work with T being 1 over FS1, the 8 kilohertz rate. Once I enter this domain and cross onto this side, and I need to do filtering or any manipulation that involves sampling, knowing what the sample spacing is, now I have to work with FS2. So be very conscious of that, because I know that's one of the blundering spots that you get into with this. Um, this is a real simulation, so like any good thing, um, you can mess things up, and then your signal is, is hopelessly lost. You won't hear anything. You'll be trying to get the speech signal to come out the other end, and it will sound really, really messed up. And you'll be saying, it doesn't sound good, but this, I'm doing everything right. A mistake like this can lead to some pretty bad sounding sound, or nothing at all, because it shifts the spectrum to an area that your filter is eliminating. So what about the, in yeah, and you're going to use Butterworth filters, so I pretty much lead you through that. I think your experience in 3205 probably has you pretty good with this. You can follow the instructions here, but you've had some exposure to these functions in MATLAB, right? Mm -hmm. So that builds your filters. Upsampling and interpolation. So formally the upsampler I'm not sure if what you were saying, Rob, was totally correct, but I'm just going to tell you what, it, what the upsampler is. The upsampler takes and stuffs L minus 1, 0 samples in between every input sample. That's what upsampling does. But because zeros are stuffed in between, as if to say now the samples are taking, taken L times as often as they were originally, and then you have to come along with a filter that's going to fill in those samples. So if you had your original waveform had these blue signal samples on it. And then you came along and stuffed in a bunch of red ones. I'm not going to put 11 of them in there. I'm just going to put three in. What the interpolator filter does is it, it basically fills in 
values in between is what it's doing. It's interpolating, just like you probably learned in high school or something. Maybe you don't learn that anymore. When I was going to school, we had graph paper and we had to learn how to do interpolation between two data points. If we were, you know, if we were given two data points, we had to find linearly interpolate. Did you guys ever have to do that? Never, ever, or just a long time ago? Okay. So a digital filter can do that for you. A digital filter can do better than that. Linear interpolation does what? Straight line and then would sample. So a fancy filter can actually put a curvature on it like I showed in the, showed in the picture. So, yeah, that's what interp does. Yes, you have to, right? But we're, sa we're satisfying sampling theory. It's just the filter will not be a brick wall filter, so it's going to, an ideal interpolator filter is, do you have any guesses? What's a perfect interpolator function? A sync function actually is a perfect interpolator because the Fourier transform of a sync function is a, is a rectangle, right? And that would be the brick wall. So it would not lose anything. You won't get any aliasing or anything like that. But a sync function has tails that go all the way out to here. So it says it would be grabbing values from the original waveform all the way out to plus and minus infinity, taking those tails into account and aggregating all that at the one value that you're trying to interpolate to. And that's not realizable, right? So you have to do it with a with a um, a causal filter. It can still be an IIR filter, but it can't use past or future values of the input to interpolate to the present. And well, here's part of the other part of the story, I guess, an a, um, information theory thing. If you wanted the the waveform at 96 kilosamples per second to begin with. You could sort of slap yourself in the head and say, why didn't I sample it that way at the analog source when I first had this information at my disposal, right? You were kind of like, I only sample it at eight kilosamples. What a fool. I mean, I've missed something by doing that. And now I'm going to try to take it back to 96 again by stuffing samples in between. But then you can hold on and not be so hard on yourself and say, well, if the signal only had information up to four kilohertz in it, and I sample it at 8K, Nyquist's theorem says I should have everything I need to do the job. But then you come into the filtering and the causality stuff. So it's, it's not that bad of a deal. But if you do have that opportunity, you'd probably say I'll sample it at the higher rate and I'll have more information. My life will be a little bit easier if I can manage it that way. So the function that you use is in... This thing won't shift on me.